Hi and welcome to the course. Thanks for joining. As we discussed in the promo video, this course is going to be about both the theory of probability and statistics and the application of that using Python code. So let's try and get the setup of the code environment out of the way first. For that, we are going to use Python and the Python distribution that I recommend is Anaconda. Now, if you're already comfortable with Python and you can set it up and you can work with Jupyter Notebooks, you can skip this video as it's supposed to be a primer for those who have had prior programming experience, but not Python experience. So you can skip it completely and go on to the next video where we start talking about our specific data. Please do remember that this is by no means a thorough introduction to Python. This is just to give you an idea of what the syntax looks like. It's very simple, straightforward syntax. So we're covering it over here so that you can get the most benefit out of this course. And if there is a particular piece of syntax that you have not seen before, then you can refer to this video later on during the course. Okay. So with that said, let's get started on setting up our environment. Right. I recommend that you install the Anaconda distribution. It's by far the most popular Python distribution nowadays, and it really makes your job a lot easier. So all you have to do is go and search for Anaconda download and go to this individual edition. So you'll arrive here. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see the Anaconda installers for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So you can set up Anaconda for whichever operating system you want to work on. If you're on Windows, all you have to do is install the 64-bit graphics installer. It's an executable. You just run it and you get everything set up. If you're on Mac, you use the PKG installer. I recommend that. And on Linux, you can download the 64-bit installer which is a shell script. So let's take a look at setting up the environment on all three of the platforms really quickly. So after you install on Windows, you can go over to the Anaconda prompt as given in the official documentation. So all you have to do is just go to your start menu and type Anaconda prompt and click on that and you'll have a blank prompt. If you're on Mac, you simply have to start your normal terminal program. On Linux, you can go for the official documentation again and install the required libraries and simply go ahead and run the script that you downloaded using this command. Okay. So just bash in the script name. Okay. There is a slight problem with the M1 Mac. So if you're on M1 Mac, I recommend that you use miniforge. So you can go to conda forge slash miniforge on GitHub and it has the installation instructions over here. You can simply download the x86 underscore 64 version or the Apple Silicon version. So if you're on M1, you probably want this. Okay. So regardless of which operating system you're on, you will arrive at a terminal where you can issue commands. So if you're on Windows, you will have this Anaconda prompt open up and simply go ahead and download the zip file for all the notebooks on your desktop or wherever you want. And then if you go to your prompt, you can issue these commands to start Jupyter Notebook. So this is a very basic introduction to Python. If you have any problems with this, please do ask. If you already have an understanding of Python and how to use Jupyter Notebooks, then you shouldn't even be watching this, okay? Right, so once you go to your terminal, you can say CD desktop, and here we have the files that you downloaded. So the zip file, and then you extract it to get the folder out. So this is the stuff that is available in this prop-cs folder. So if you go there, you can start the Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab using the command Jupyter Lab. Okay. Remember, if you're on Windows, you should not be using the normal Windows command prompt. You should be using the Anaconda prompt. So once you start the Jupyter Lab, you will get this environment in which you will have a notebook section over here where you can click on Python 3 and start a new Python 3 notebook all the files that you have extracted are available over here. So these are the same files that you extracted here. Okay. If you want to start a new blank notebook, you can click on Python three and it will show this notebook to you. I'll show you how to run commands in this notebook in just a little while in our Python crash course. For now, you can go ahead and close this, click on discard. These are the files that are already available. We can take a look at the basics of Python in a really short while. You double click on the file and you see this. So, this is what is called a Jupyter Notebook. It's very, very useful for experimenting in data science, machine learning, probability statistics, all of those things, right? So what you do is you have these cells over here. You can click on a cell and you can type some command and you can hold down shift and hit enter and it will run that command and produce the output for you. So this is an interactive environment. Because Python is interpreted, you can interact with it very easily and it helps a lot with experimentation if you work with Jupyter Notebook. I highly recommend that you don't do spider if you already know Python. So now we're going to go over the basics of Python really quickly. If you have any problem, you can either go and take a look at a detailed Python course. 
it's not really necessary because all the Python that we need in this course is very, very basic and very simple. So I'll just give you an overview of that really quickly over here. So you can save these into variables. So you can say X is equal to 25. You don't need to define what the data type of X is. Python is dynamically typed. It will calculate the data type automatically. So X is going to hold the value 25. Okay. You don't need to define or declare the variables. Okay. You can have arithmetic operations. So five plus minus multiply division and modulus operator. And you have the normal print function, which is a built in if you want to output the values. Okay. You have Boolean operators and or and not as before you can output them definition of functions in python is easier if you get used to it so there is a little problem with that you use the function keyword def which is for define then you give it the function name and then the parameters obviously you don't need parameter types over here because python interprets the type automatically and then you do some function body at the end of which you can have a return now the function body is defined using indentation that is different in python you use one two three four spaces or a tab character either of the two make a habit of just picking one you can't mix them together but four spaces over here and you can have the body everything that is indented four spaces is going to be the body of this function so def square you define the square function now you can call it as usual using square five you can have a optional parameter if you're used to function overloading this is how you do this so this message parameter if you do give it a value it's going to be used if you don't then it's going to have a default value of answer over here so this is the function body def square and all of this if we call square four it's going to go over here and it's going to use this message value right but if you do give it a message value from the outside it's going to use that okay this 16 that you're seeing is the return value of the last expression in the notebook cell. You can also have functions coming in from other packages. So for instance, you have a math package, which is a built-in package in Python. You use it by importing it and you say import math. So instead of include, you have import over here. So import math, and then you can use math dot square root number, and it's going to calculate the square root of that number for you. You can also have a shorthand for this. So from math import square root. So not the whole library, but just the square root function is going to be imported over here. When you do that, you don't need to prepend this with math dot and you can simply say square root num and it should work after I run this. Okay. So that was an error that you saw. Branching and iteration is equally easy. So you have a variable over here, x equal to 75. You can say if x is greater than 60, you don't need parentheses around the expression. So if x is greater than 60, we output this elif is short for else if and you can have the whole if else if ladder over here okay so hope that makes sense so we have 15 and it works out you can have loops for i in one two three it's going to loop over all three elements a shorthand for this is the range function so you can say for i in range 10 print number is i and it's going to go from zero to nine okay so it stops just before this number so at nine you can also go from one to nine by saying one to 10. So it goes from one to nine. So this is the start point and this is just beyond the end point. You'll get used to it. You can also say that we should have a step of size two. So it's going to go from one, three, five, seven. And again, it's going to stop just before 10. Okay. So these are different ways of looping over things. Now we have some basic built-in data structures in Python, which are very useful and we use them very often. So for instance, we have a list. Think of this as a, an array, a dynamic array, which you can increase or decrease the size of, and it can have heterogeneous data in it. So you have L is equal to one, two, three, you can do a zero based index. So you can say L of zero, which is going to be this guy over here. You can say L of three, which is going to give you an error with list index out of range. So it's zero, one, and two, three is out of range. Okay. You can also loop over a whole list by saying for I in L, it's going to output the whole list. You can create the sum or length of a list using built-in functions sum and length. And you will notice that I am issuing two function calls over here, separated by a comma. Each of them is going to return a value and they are going to go into the corresponding values to the left of the assignment operator. So you can do multiple simultaneous assignments in Python using this syntax, comma separated over here, right? So sum goes into added and length goes into counted. So six is the sum and three is the count. Okay. You can have this range that you saw over here. 
assigned to a variable so you can have l is equal to range 20 this thing is special it doesn't actually go from 0 to 19 it saves in itself that it should go when called from 0 to 19 it's a special type of function called generator you might get confused looking at this thing so i just wanted to show you if you want to convert it into a list you can do casting like that and now this converts into a list okay so remember that this is a crash course if you don't know python you might have to spend a little bit of time with this but really if you understand the basics of this then you'll get enough practice during the course as well you can think of this as a reference you can come back to this whenever you have some pro some sort of a code problem or a syntax problem in the rest of the course okay you can cast the l2 a list and then output that let's go ahead and do a very simple case study so we have the odds list over here we want to loop over l and save all the odd variables in this odds list so we are going to loop over l for i in l if i modulus 2 is equal to 1 we are going to append the ith element into the odds okay so we do that so odds becomes 1 3 5 7 9 11 up to 19 okay we can do it in a shorthand as well this is called the list comprehensions and it's very commonly used so you should get comfortable with this essentially we take the exact same thing so this exact same loop for i in l and we arrange it in a slightly different syntax what this says is loop over the whole list put each element in i check if this condition is met if it is met then put it in that list okay so that is exactly what we're doing over here loop over the whole list check a condition if it is appended to the output list this is what it's saying right so you can go ahead and do that it gives you the exact same thing out and now you can go ahead and save it into a list okay 1357 911 17 and 19 what if you want squares of these you simply change the value over here what do you want in the list i don't want i i want the square of i okay so there goes the output okay so that is a list these are called list comprehensions very commonly used in python so you should at least understand what the syntax is the syntax is fairly straightforward square brackets at the beginning and end and in the middle three parts one is which collection you want to loop over what is your criteria and when the criteria is met what should go into the output list another data structure is dictionaries so dictionaries are maps if you are familiar with them so they are key value pairs so for key one the value is one for key two the value is two for key three the value is this three over here obviously they can be any other things starting and ending braces define a dictionary and then we save them into a variable d okay d of one gives you one back d of four will give you an error because there is no four key over here okay d of character one or string one is also going to give you an error so because this is not present in the dictionary the digit one is present we can call based on that but not on this character okay we can add stuff to the dictionary so we can say d of four is equal to four and now if you try to access d of four it works okay we can also go ahead and say d of whatever string and assign something else to it strings in python can be both using double quotes or single quotes they are the same okay and then if we say d of something it should work fine let's loop over the dictionaries so we are going to loop over this dictionary that we just defined we are going to sum over the keys and their values okay so the syntax for that is just as we had for i in l we are going to do for k comma v in d dot items so for each key value pair that we have over here it's going to take this key and put it in k and take this value and put it in v next time in the loop this is going to go into the k and this is going to go into the v so we are going to save the value of k into the sum of keys okay and we are going to append this when applied to the string is going to do a concatenation so we are going to concat all the values together okay so that is what is output over here the final data structure that we want to take a look at is tuples it's very similar to lists except that you cannot do an assignment to it so it's called immutable okay so that gives you an error tuple object does not support item assignment once you put something in the tuple it stays there it does not change they have their own purposes we're not going into that we're just giving you an overview of the syntax that we have we also come across objects in python so we'll briefly go over that you can define new classes using the keyword class and then the class name then there is a colon and this whole thing indented is the 
body of the class. You define the constructor using underscore underscore init function. The first parameter of that has to be self. This self is very similar to this keyword of Java and C++ and Sharp and all of those. Okay, But in Python, you have to write it explicitly over here. You can access member fields using self.x and self.y. So this x is this local variable and this x is the member field. You can also have a string representation using the underscore underscore str. So when you try to print this point function, so when you try to print an object of class point, this function is going to be automatically called. At least for this course, you won't have to define any new objects, but you will be using them. So we are going to see the syntax for use of those objects. So you do p1 is equal to point and you can now have p1 is equal to p1.x. If you recall, this is the default value for x. So because we did not pass any value for x over here, x gets the value zero. But we have the option of passing values to it. So we can pass it the values two and four and those will go into x and y respectively. And from there, they go into the x and y member fields. And when we print the point output, it's going to output these over here. So let's go ahead and output these. Okay, so p1 is equal to zero, this guy over here, and the whole p1 is output as zero comma zero because of this str function. Okay. Finally, let's go ahead and take a look at how we can draw plots. So there is a very popular library called matplotlib, which you simply import using the import keyword. You also import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. So matplotlib is a very old library, so it has some syntax problems, but it works perfectly well. It doesn't give you errors. You just have to get used to writing them like this, okay? We want matplotlib to draw the figures or graphs or plots that it draws into this notebook. And for that, we have this keyword over here, okay? So matplotlib should draw in line in this notebook. So we run that. Then we have some values over here. We simply put them in a list and we say plt.plot, give it the vals, give it a color, give it a line width. There are many, many other options that we'll see during the rest of the course. So you can run that and you get a plot out over here, right? So you will see this annoying line over here. You can get rid of that by assigning the return value. This is the return value into a variable that we do not care about. So that's underscore is equal to means put the return value. Drawing is another thing, but this return value should go into a variable that I don't care about. So that gets rid of the line. We can also do a plot with both X and Y axis. So this is the x-axis, a list, this is the y-axis, and we can say plt.plot x comma y, and now it's going to take the values. So I have to run this first. So it's going to take the values, 1, 10, so that's 110, 220, so 220, 310, 310, 620, so all the way over here, 620, and then 740, 740 over here, okay? We can also change this line plot to a scatter plot, so like that, okay? it has turned into a scatter plot using the scatter function. There are a lot of options. We'll come back to these later on in the course. In fact, in the next video, we are going to take a look at how to do plots in detail. Finally, if you come across a package that you don't have installed and you get an error on that, you can install packages from within the notebook using exclamation mark pip install numpy. So this will install the numpy package for you. Whenever we come across a package that isn't available by default in your Anaconda environment, I'm going to tell you to install it using the pip command. Okay. So that's it for the crash course of Python. As before, this is by no means a thorough Python course. If you really have no understanding of Python, you might have to spend some time with it. But as you can see, it's fairly straightforward. And all the codes that we cover in the rest of the course are going to be explained quite thoroughly. So you should have no problem understanding them with a little bit of effort.